And so welcome everyone. This is Old Growth Rising, a program sponsored by the Granby Public Library and the Granby Land Trust. We're delighted to host Connor Hogan. He is, um, well, he's a lot of things here. He has um, served as um, the assistant manager of the Yale School of Forests. Um, that was overseeing 11,000 acres of working forest across New England. He has experience in forest restoration, urban forestry and landscape design. And of course, most importantly, Connor Hogan joined McLean Game Refuge in the summer of 2017 as the fourth director since that game refuge opened in 1932. And at the McLean Game Refuge, he oversees research, conservation, education, and recreation across 4,400 acres of forests, meadows, and waterways. And he works closely with the McLean president and the board of trustees to carry out the management goals set forth by the founder, Senator George McLean. And on that happy note, I'm going to give a warm welcome to Connor Hogan for the program Old Growth Rising. Welcome, Connor. Thank you, Holly, and thank you everyone for coming out this evening. Um, thank you to the Granby Public Library and the Granby Land Trust for, for making this possible. I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, let's do this right now. Okay. So let me just give me one second here. Okay. <clears throat> so um, my name is Connor Hogan, and I'm the director of the McLean Game Refuge, as Holly mentioned. And uh, throughout this presentation, you'll see it is mostly photos because I think visual learning is one of the better ways. And I, all the photos here have been taken by me with a few exceptions, and those are noted on the photos. Okay, let's see here. So uh, the McLean Game Refuge, I, I saw a lot of familiar faces come in. Many of you know this place very well. Some of you might have, might even know it better than me. Uh, the, what we're focused on at the Game Refuge is four topics, research, conservation, education, and recreation. And, <clears throat> and within the course of our work, we've discovered a number of things and we, we monitor a number of things, but uh, some of our, our main, uh, main takeaways is that it's the largest private wildlife sanctuary in Connecticut. Um, we have forests that are either just started growing uh, or they are old growth. And we'll find out that there is, there is a patch at the game refuge. <clears throat> we have 22 species that are listed by the state of Connecticut as threatened, endangered, or special concern. And we're discovering new ones all the time. We have documented over, over 1,200 species of plants, animals, insects, protozoa, amoebas, et cetera, at the Game Refuge just in the past four years. And we have um, 27 miles of trails to recreate. So it's a great place to visit, great place to see nature. And um, you know, after this, if you have questions about the Game Refuge, feel free to, to reach out. But my, my talk today is not specifically about the Game Refuge. Um, it is about old growth forests. And the reason I, we're, we're talking today is there's been a lot of discussion about old growth forests. And they're particularly interesting to me. I'm, I, I'm a conservationist, a forester, and a land manager. And I think that the, the, my background really helps me appreciate all of the different ways that, that we New Englanders engage with our landscape. Um, as I should say, if you have questions about anything I say, you'll notice in the lower left-hand corner of each slide, there's a number. And if you have a question later on at the end, you can refer to the number of the slide and, and I will come back to it for a discussion. Anyway, so today I have two main questions that I wanna work through with you. And the first one is, oh, the first one is about Connecticut's forests. They are aging, they're, they're, they're growing older and many of us in our lifetimes have taken note of that. And the question is, will they become old growth forests? Um, and the second question is, should Connecticut's forests become old growth forests? And if, if they should, should all of them, should some of them, what, what amount, what, what's the right amount here? So um, the first thing we need to do is kind of get on the same page about old growth forests. Most of you, when you hear old growth forests, you know, your mind conjures images of this, uh, a redwood forest out in California that's 2000 years old. It's magnificent, but it's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about Eastern old growth forests, which I think are also magnificent if somewhat uh, humbler in, in size, uh, 
and age. Um, but they are, um, they are, they do exist. There are remnants, and um, and I think that we're going to see a lot more in, in the coming generations. So, eastern old growth forest. There's a number of ways to define old growth forests, and some people are very passionate about the, how they do it. Generally, it, most people agree that forests that were that are dominated by old trees and that began growing before Europeans arrived in the, in, in the 1620s are old growth forests. I believe that we can also include forests that began growing after European arrival, but following a disturbance that wasn't caused by Europeans or early Americans. So that would mean, you know, a, a forest fire started by Native Americans or by lightning or a hurricane, any large disturbance that kind of cleared the land. So there's also some researchers from the Yale School of Forestry that put together uh, a program to understand them in a more in a more sequential way, and they broke down the de the development of our eastern forests into four phases: stand initiation, stem exclusion, understory reinitiation, and old growth. I'm going to go through this briefly with you to kind of give you the background of how forests develop. And do you, I, I will say that. This is a great framework, but it is not a hard written rule. The New England forests are complicated and they're constantly changing. So sometimes forests don't fit neatly into one of these categories. So to begin stand initiation, as you'll see from this little diagram here, a bunch of small trees, you know, it might have, it's, they began growing in an old field or after a fire or a hurricane, tons of sunlight. And a, and a lot of these trees are fast growing trees. Birches oh, yeah, yeah. and aspens, uh, cherries in the cedars, oaks, pines, ash, poplar. There's a whole host of trees. And in, in fact, in a forest, this is the most diverse phase of forest for tree species. You might see a field growing of 30 or 40 different tree species in one area, um, but it doesn't last terribly long. It'll, this is what it, lo it might look like. And, and you might recognize these are aspen trees here, and there's some birches here, a whole bunch of trees in this mix of young forest. Um, before long, though, those trees start to compete intensively for light, and some of them start to die out, and, and the ones that, that linger on form this almost layer of foliage that's very dense with, with pole-like trees. It's very neat in the understory. There's not much debris. It's very little vegetation because they're so shaded. And some of these trees that, that are a bit longer lived start to take over and those birches and those aspens start to fall out. And so if some of you remember when you were young seeing more birches and aspens around Granby Simsbury in Connecticut, that was because the forests were younger. And as the forests of age, those type of trees tend to fall out of, it, out of the forest. And this is what it might look like in that stem exclusion phase. Lots of pole-like trees, not much going on on the understory here. Well, as that, that forest ages, lightning strikes, insect infestations, um, more, more competition for sunlight, trees start to, to die and little gaps start and you start to get some trees growing up in the under, on, on the understory. And, um, and some of the trees that, um, that are kind of the, they, they weren't the first ones to go, but they start, but they're not extremely tolerant to shade. They start to fall out and you start to get a different kind of forest altogether. And, um, and I, I've put some different species on here. Uh, the, the red maples and hickories can linger on in this phase, but they start, they start to, to become less abundant. And this is what that forest looks like. You get a couple of large trees in the forest, intermittent with smaller trees, especially these trees like this here. This is an Eastern hemlock, and these are black birch trees, and they tolerate shade quite well. So they're, they're of a different type of forest than the forest that began. And the last phase is old growth. And old growth is a forest that has had significant decay. Many of the earliest trees that began in the forest uh, are all gone. Many of the oaks are gone, the hickories are gone, red maple, ash, a lot of these species are, have died out of the forest. And you tend to have trees that can grow in, in a lot of shade and grow slowly and, and grow for a long time. Like sugar maple, hemlock, beech, black and yellow birch, um, and, and depending on where you are, you might also see red cedar or Atlantic white cedar if it's a specific ridge top or, or bog. Uh, 
These forests are very complex. And this is what an old growth forest might look like. And this here, you can see the dominant tree is a, is a hemlock tree, a very large hemlock tree. And behind it are, are these, these are tulip poplars that began in the earliest part of the forest and are lingering on much, much later. But the forest is very deep. There's lots of different structure. So to help you better understand old growth, Eastern old growth forests, there here are some of the key features you'll see. First thing is old trees. Everyone loves to see old trees. I love to see old trees. Um, on the left, you'll see a yellow birch. And yellow birch, when they're young, have smooth, shiny bark. And they're generally very straight, and they have willowy limbs. And as they get older, you can see the bark is extremely rough. And it's platy almost. And as it, it, it no longer has any light, willowy limbs, the limbs are thick, and there's not very many of them on the tree. And in addition, you can see that storms broke off the tops numerous times, creating what uh, foresters refer to as a stag-headed crown. It almost looks like a head of antlers on the tree. And to the right, you see this is an old sugar maple, a very old sugar maple. And again, it has only a few very thick, large limbs, and it doesn't have many small limbs. Uh, on the left, this is an eastern hemlock, which may be the quintessential old growth tree in Connecticut. And old growth trees, you saw in that slide of understory reinitiation, they looked like Christmas trees with branches all the way to the ground. But when hemlock trees enter their, their later years, after two, two, three hundred years, they tend to drop all those lower limbs and only have branches high in the canopy. And uh, this is about 75 feet from the ground to the first branch in this hemlock. And then on the right, this is a picture of a black birch, which grows very similarly to the yellow birch. This is another stag-headed crown, and the birches have these thick, thick bark, and, and they don't resemble anything they did when they were young. Also in old growth forests is an abundance of woody debris. These trees, when, they, when individual trees fall, they, they have enormous volume in their limbs and their trunks that land on the ground, and they take a long time to decompose. Some of the species are naturally rot resistant, such as white pine trees. Their heartwood can linger as a log on the ground for 100 years easily. You also see a lot of standing dead trees, trees that died from lightning strikes, or, or maybe they just they had a, a root fungus. It's hard to tell, but that, that's a very common feature. But as far as forestry goes, we really look at canopy structure. And one of the things that's most in, important about these old growth forests is that they have a very complex vegetation structure. So they, at the very top, you have very tall trees with these tall crowns, and you have layers of trees at different ages and different sizes all the way down. Depending on the age of your forest or the, and the growing site, it might be 140 feet or more of different layers of branches all the way down to the ground. Um, with with the creation of all that woody, woody um, debris in the forest is, is, um, is uh, small disturbances like lightning strikes, natural decline, like I said, insect, insect infestation or parasitic fungi. Um, and what it does is it creates or a small wind event and you get individual trees or small groups of trees and they create gaps in the forest, all over the forest and sometimes you get a microburst, or maybe beavers were, have re, re returned to an area after being absent for many years and they cut down and destroy the forest. And so you get larger gaps. And so, overall, in these eastern old growth forests, there's an incredible diversity of age classes of trees, of, of gaps in, in the forest, and, re, and regenerating gaps, and species that come in at different times. And this photo here is, is a photo of the game refuge. Um, so it's not old growth per se, but you can really get a feel for what a diverse forest structure looks like. You have hickories on this little ridge, pine trees in this on the slope, and then you have a sycamore um, floodplain, and then you have an oak foreground. It's less stratified across the, the landscape in an old growth, but you get all of these features. So some of you might be wondering if you've ever seen old growth forests. Well, you, you may have, but only if you've been looking for them, because there's not much. There are different estimates for the amount. It's well documented that there's at least three or 400 acres of old growth in Connecticut. 
And some people will lump in an extra couple hundred acres of forests that are old, but don't meet the, the standards that we already set for old growth because they, they began growing after uh, a, an early American disturbance. But we are discovering new little tracks all the time. For example, a young man um, from, uh, from WPI found 40 acres of old growth forest in Ender State Forest. Um, and at the Game Refuge, uh, we, we found five, five or six acres of old growth forest. And it, it happens iteratively across the state. So there might be a thousand acres. Um, and they're really in hard to get places. And that's why we don't really know where they are. Um, they're often in bogs or ridge tops, ravines, slopes. And they're, as I mentioned before, they're dominated, if you look on the left, by eastern hemlock, sugar maple, beech, and birch. And uh, I should say black and yellow, because paper birch and gray birch, really, they're, they're live fast, die young trees from those early forest stages. And on the right, these are also some of the old growth trees you'll find, but they're really more site specific. They're not, you're not going to find them in the average forest that chestnut oak would tend to be on ridges, as do eastern red cedar. Um, our, actually, our oldest tree in the state is an eastern red cedar that was over 600 years old on Talcott Mountain. Um, we also have Atlantic white cedar in some bogs. There's one in North Branford that's almost 200 years old. And, and there's black gum, which some people call tupelo. And I've seen ones in Connecticut that are certainly over 300 years old, but again, in bogs. So probably the best place in the state to see old growth forest is Great Mountain Forest. It's a working forest in uh, North Fork and Falls Village, and it, and it has a countless little ravines and bogs where there are old growth forests. None of them are particularly large areas, but they have some magnificent trees like this hemlock and, and yellow birch ravine. Um, on the Appalachian Trail, right where Massachusetts meets Connecticut is Sage's Ravine. And in a couple of the watersheds there, there are old growth hemlock forests, which are, again, really beautiful, something out of Lord of the Rings. Um, here are some other sites where you might find them. Um, there's quite a few, but these are the better known ones. There's a, a few old growth patches on Canaan Mountain. Um, the town of Colebrook has a, a couple different places. Ender State Forest has old growth. At the Game Refuge, we have old growth, as I mentioned. Um, I should say now it's not on a trail and it's not open to the public because it's in a hard to reach place and it's um, we're really trying to protect it. Mohawk Mountain, uh, Talcott Mountain and White Memorial Foundation. White Memorial Foundation and Conservation Center has a great path right through their old growth forest called Catlin Woods. And it's, a, it's an easy visit. I, I recommend it if you wanna get a, a little snapshot of old growth. So back to our question. Will Connecticut's forests become old growth? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is consider for Connecticut's forests today. What are they? Well, the Connecticut Deep put together a, a survey. Um, uh, they took the, in 2020 and they, they collected data from 2019 supported by the Forest Service. And they found that Connecticut's forests are, are mostly between 60 and 100 years old, which may sound old, but it's, our forests can live a 400 to 600 years. So that's really quite young. And as far as our model goes, that really puts us mostly in the second stage of stem exclusion, but some of it is an understory reinitiation in that third stage. And almost, as I mentioned, almost nothing in the old growth. In addition to being young, it's almost all one species type. 70% is an oak hickory forest. These other, groups here, you'll see Elmash, Cottonwood, Maple Beach, Birch, etc. Notice how there's not even a hemlock forest option here. And hemlock forests are, are very common old growth forests. Um, I should say oak hickory is a catch-all term to mean a forest dominated by oaks with, with a large hickory component and a bunch of other common trees that we see, the maples, the birches, ash, beech, hemlock, pine, etc. But it's mostly oaks and hickories. And, and throughout most of its, especially as you go further north, it becomes mostly oak. And this is what it looks like. This should look like most of the forests you see in Connecticut. This is a slightly drier area, but pretty much it's going to be a bunch of nice big trees of, and a pretty empty understory. So as a, uh, just to kind of sum it up, it's, it's pretty much a single age of forest without a complex canopy. 
It has um, little complexity in terms of down woody debris, leaning trees. The crowns of trees are pretty straight and willowy, you know, straight with not many side branches. Um, the soil isn't very deep or, or well developed. And for the most part, the forest doesn't support all its full complement of animals and plants. But to answer our question, we all around the state, we're seeing forests develop into those old growth stages. That is the trajectory of our forest because beavers cut down trees. They dam and modify forest lands by, by flooding low lying areas in, in clear land that occasionally then uh, they intermittently, beavers often will, will work an area for 40 years and abandon it for a number of decades. And so that breaks up the landscape. Um, some of our bigger and older trees are starting to fall apart and you get these big accumulations of woody debris. Uh, also, you get what, what we call gap dynamics, which is where you get gap formation across the forest from small single tree events, um, which, as we mentioned earlier, help create this mosaic effect on the landscape. Localized wind events. This is at the game refuge, and these are spring. Uh, these are some. This is a windstorm from uh, two springs ago, and these pine trees. This is a tall old pine. Well, not particularly old, but tall, amazing pine forest. And the trees are are down like pickup sticks, and it's creating this amazing, amazingly complex understory. And with these events, the understory isn't just structurally complex. It also is a complex with different plants. And this here is at the game refuge. You can, you can see how the mosses have really come into their own along the, on the trees and the ferns are, are developing in different little niches along the forest. And in some of these forests that are, that are coming back, you, you start to see these plant communities. And probably most importantly, the forest is transitioning to um, one dominated by early, early and mid successional trees. That means trees that 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 um, that arrived when there was abundant light to trees that started growing in shade, and those shade trees are now coming up beneath the sun loving trees and taking over. And this here is a sugar maple that is 170 years old at the game refuge, and it is now one of the dominant trees in this area. And you can see that it is now assuming its place as a dominant tree. And once that happens throughout the forest. It, it is a sign that this forest is turning into old growth. Now, some of the best forests in Connecticut that aren't old growth are these very old second old growth forests or second growth forests. And I use second growth as a term to mean a forest that began growing along after, after the clearing or logging, whether it's clearing for agriculture or logging by uh, colonists or early Americans. And so at the game refuge, we have I'll, give you, I'll show you three sites here that are pretty unique. This is Creek Trail, um, right in the middle of the eastern half of the game refuge. And it's a towering pine forest that's 130, 135 years old. And it really starts to show signs of this old growth forest with a lot of understory plants, complex canopy, downed big trees. Um, and this, this is on West Ledge Trail on the western side of the game refuge in, in Simsbury. And uh, we've cored, some of these oak trees are, are tremendous, 50 inch wide oak trees, and they are nearing the peak of their lives. Um, and they'll probably live for a few hundred more, but you can see the forest is starting to transition and it's mostly maple underneath. Um, and then our oldest forest that is easily visible is on Sandy Trail on the Eastern half of the game refuge. At the Southern end of Sandy Trail, there is a grove of hemlocks. It's essentially a pure hemlock forest. And we've cored trees in that stand that are over 230 years old. Pretty impressive area. And you really get a feel for what, what, is, what will happen to the rest of the forest as they age. Belden Forest in Simsbury, um, just behind this, the, the first church on uh, Hot Meadow Street is uh, 40 acres of forest. And in it is a really lovely pine grove with with 170, I, I think the oldest tree core I took there was about 165 years, but that was some time ago. So they're probably around 170 years and, um, and you, you can really feel small in, 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 in this magical forest. And in my opinion, the most amazing forest, pine forest in Connecticut is the Ballyhack Preserve. It's quite small in Cornwall, uh, 
Um, but I measured trees here that were 156 feet tall, which and this is a few years ago, which would put them at among the very tallest in Connecticut, possibly the tallest. And this forest here doesn't look particularly amazing because every tree is big. I should have had someone stand for, for scale, but Valley Hack Preserve, go visit it. And Cathedral Pines, in, also in Cornwall, was once the crown jewel of old forests in Connecticut. Um, it, it's over 200 years, I think, at this point, but it was hit by a, a tornado in the, in the late 80s, and, and a significant portion was knocked down. So it is, it's still amazing. There's still a lot to see there. <clears throat> People State Forest is amazing and doesn't get, I don't think, receives the appreciation it deserves, but it has some lovely old hemlock forests like this. And uh, across the river, for those of you daring to make the trip, there is there are wonderful places in the Yale Myers Forest. I believe the Nipmuc Trail goes, uh, which is a blue a blue blaze trail maintained by the Connecticut Forest and Parks Association, goes through the Yale Myers Forest. And there's lots of patches along where you'll see these old trees. Like I, I didn't get a chance to core these trees to get a date, but based on their bark, I I guess they're easily 150 years old. So I think we can safely answer our first question that. Our, our Connecticut mat maturing forests will become old growth. Which brings us to our second question, should they become old growth? Well, let's talk about the ecological significance of old growth to even know why, why, why are we talking about it? Well, the first value that an old growth forest provides ecologically is that they have large tree cavities, which sounds really obvious, but you can't get large tree cavities in a forest unless the trees are really large. Um, and they can be in a tree or they can be at the base, but we have large cavity nesters and bears will nest in a tree trunk. Like these black bears, this is a, a cub standing on its mom's back to reach uh, tupelo berries at the game refuge. Um, we also have gray foxes. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, gray foxes actually can climb trees. They're quite different from our red foxes. And they also like to nest in tree cavities, or I should say den in tree cavities. And so their success is also dependent on having appropriate denning habitat. This photo was, was captured by one of our, uh, our, our researchers, Samantha Lewis, with a, a, a motion sensor camera. Um, medium tree cavities you can have in younger forests. Um, of course, um, they don't need to be as in large trees, but they're, they're, they're more abundant in old forests because there's been more time for small little disturbances to, you know, a falling tree can knock a branch off of another tree or, or other damage can cause uh, uh, com complex tree trunks. And um, bar barred owls and raccoons, like this is, a, this is a barred owlet, but barred owls and raccoons and possums and other small or medium small animals can will use these cavities. And then small cavity users like birds uh, use, uh, excuse me, Small cavities used by birds and other animals are abundant in old growth forests. Again, not required to be in an old growth forest to have a small cavity, but they're more abundant. Flying squirrels, this is also at the game refuge, use, use these uh, small cavities. Old trees in these forests with their complex trunks and bark also support wildlife in a different way. This is a red maple tree that's, that's you can tell by its bark, it's much older than the smooth bark of a young maple. And underneath this peeling bark, um, uh, certain insects will lay their eggs. And so it's a great place to forage, but also tree frogs and bats and even birds will nest under that bark. And one great example is this is a brown creeper, which is a bird that is most commonly found in dark interior older forests because they need to nest under bark, under, under flaky tree bark, and they love to forage up the trunks of trees. Also in these, these old trees, they might become stag headed like I showed you with the, with the birches, but they also might graft into each other. This is something I've seen a number of times in our older pine trees in Connecticut is where branches will grow from one tree into the next. And then the tree will start to incorporate that branch into their, into their trunk. And so these, they form these platforms and, and walkways and byways that wildlife love to use. And uh, they form platforms like this is a red-tailed hawk that will that that I found nesting in the, the broken top of an old pine. And in when they're done with these nests, they abandon them. And in the winter, 
great horned owls come in and use the, the red tail hawk nests almost as a timeshare. And again, it's because of these complex trunks that form these, these platforms that, 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 that uh, the birds can use. And, and very interestingly, a lot of these old trees have cavities that collect water. And trees are, they're amazingly capable of resisting rot, and especially in these older trees, um, or, or they linger with the rot. But regardless, the water collects and remains in these trees and does not evaporate in the hottest part of the summer. It is an important, a very important water source for, for insects and small mammals that can't travel far, like, like a bear could, to try and find water. Um, <clears throat> so this here is at the game refuge, and this photo I took during the, the, the really dry year, I think it was two and a half years, two years, three years ago, we had, we had a couple of years of intense drought. Um, but also, these interior, these, these, I say interior, and what I mean by interior is, is um, forests that are not right on the edge of, of neighborhoods where they're disturbed. But um, old growth forests tend to have this, this dense protective quality that allows in, uh, animals to be buffered from, the, from, from uh, intense sunlight or human development. And there are species that only live in them. Um, and uh, this is a hermit thrush, which is my favorite bird. But they only exist in these, these deep, undisturbed forests, which almost always end up being old growth forests, or, or almost. And then <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the habitat in these is, hold on one sec here. Um, sorry, I had a computer issue. OK. Uh, they also protect uh, water, the headwaters of brooks and brooks themselves. And there are um, species that are that are obligated to live in the, in these in these cold headwaters. This is a northern spring salamander, which is a which is a protected species in Connecticut because of their populations are so low. They require very cold, protected, undisturbed headwater streams. And in Connecticut, we've done a good job of building roads and, and houses on top of hillsides or mountainsides where these headwaters begin and it opens up sunlight and warms the water um, or, or, or disturb or, or logging or, or roads cause sedimentation. So um, old growth forests protect species like the northern spring salamander. Another coal, uh, species obligate to, in these cold brooks is or brook trout and uh, that you can I don't have underwater photography uh, equipment so you can tell these photos aren't aren't as helpful to identify them, but you can believe me that on the left, that's a par, it's a young trout, and on the right, it's an adult brook trout. And these are at the game refuge in some of our very protected brooks. Um, in old growth forests, we also have a really, a really developed understory. And by that, I mean, all of the plants that would grow in the area can be found. And so, this is, an, this is part of an old growth area at the McLean Game Refuge. And you can see that all across the landscape, there are understory plants. And they're different. Up on the rock, we have, we have polypody ferns. And then we have, we have Virginia creeper here. We have wood ferns. We have Christmas ferns. We have all these different species that are using these unique uh, parts of the landscape to grow. And in some places, it's per so unique that we only find plants in kind of these uh, unusual sites we call microsites. And on top of this rock at the game refuge, I found um, some raspberry plants that uh, certain species of raspberry that we found nowhere else in the entire game refuge. Almost seven square miles of forest land, and they only exist on one or two of these rocks because the site, it just meets their ecological needs. But again, the light regimes hitting the forest floor in an old growth forest are, are, are very unique. Uh, on this tree trunk, you might get 1% of, of photoreactive light, um, photoreactive ultraviolet light. But over here, you might get 10% or 50%. And, and in here, where this log prevents the moisture from running off, you might get a wet pocket. And so the understory becomes very, very, uh, it be, also becomes a mosaic, just like the canopy, where all these different sites allow the growth of all these different plants because it's so varied. Um, we also get plants growing on plants. 
and that this is often associated with tropical forests, but we do get it in, in New England where the forests are old. And here you have two little hemlock trees growing in, the, in this broken branch of an old white oak. And also one of these things that are, that are very common on the West Coast, but are common on the East Coast and are, are nurse logs. And that's basically a log that's sitting above or on the forest floor that has this that stores moisture and is a great place for seeds to germinate and grow into new trees. And birch trees, especially yellow birch, almost exclusively grow on nurse logs and on the tipped up roots of, of trees in an old growth forest because it elevates them from all the thick leafy duff on the forest floor where their seeds would never reach the soil. We also have really amazing fungal communities in old growth forests, disproportionately varied and complex. And the first group of, of fungi are, are, are wood decomposers. These are angel's wings, which are very common in old growth forests, especially on, on, on pine logs. There's some really flashy mushrooms like the Eastern jack-o'-lantern. These are supposedly bioluminescent. I haven't been able to see that myself, but they look pretty amazing even if they're not glowing at night. Um, but we also have uh, mycorrhizal fungi. And this is a complex topic I'll try and buzz through quickly, but it merits its own presentation another day perhaps. Mycorrhizae are, are mushrooms um, that grow out these root-like structures called hyphae, and they, they intermingle with tree roots. And essentially what they do is they, they extend beyond where tree roots can to access nutrients and water and give them to the tree. And in return, the tree gives them sugars. And so it's a symbiotic relationship. And if you look at this one mushroom here, it's connected to this tree in a great relationship, but this mushroom is also connected to this tree. And what happens is sometimes these, these mycorrhizal connections end up connecting trees to trees. And this can be very important in forests. Um, we're finding out that the trees actually essentially talk to trees um, by, by sharing chemical signals that if, and they can travel very quickly through these networks. So trees up a mountain slope may be experiencing an insect outbreak and that tree will, can send chemical signals through these mycorrhizal networks from tree to tree to tree. So down the slope, trees can actually change the chemistry of their leaves. So they're no longer palatable to those insects up the slope that are attacking the trees. They're fabulous. And trees in our forest really couldn't exist almost at all without these mycorrhizal networks. Our forest would be, would, would, would nowhere, would be nowhere near as resilient to, to, to insects, to, to heat, to nutrients, uh, nutrient, uh, scarcity, um, mycorrhizal ne networks are extremely important. And we have some amazing mycorrhizal fungi at the Game Refuge. Um, this is a, an Amanita mushroom, which is a group of mushrooms um, which are abundant. And this one's called Jackson's Slender Caesar. Uh, their, their names are pretty wild, but they, it works with oak and pine trees. So mycorrhizal mushrooms generally have associations with tree types. Um, this, these are red chanterelles, which, which are generally with um, maples and other hardwoods. Um, but they create their own, their own food webs. On the left, this is a beetle that specializes in eating fun, fungus. And on the right, you see a, a gray squirrel eating, eating fungus. And um, they disperse the, the spores from the wood decaying and the mycorrhizal fungi. And, and they can be, the, the insects can be eaten by secondary predators. So that squirrel can get eaten by a hawk and the beetles can be eaten by frogs or they don't have to be beetles, they could be other insects. And they can further disperse the, the spores. And so as the forests become more complex and the habitats become more complex, you get this kind of cycling web of, of complexity. And roots and trees can thrive so much better and wood is processed so much more effectively by different decomposers and, and um, just further expanding the diversity of, of the forest. For those of you who want a quick little overview of, of mycorrhizal networks, the Patagonia Clothing Company put together a special video called Tree Line that highlights the work of Suzanne Samard, uh, an incredible um, uh, researcher from British Columbia who, who has this great um, depiction of tree, tree mycorrhizal networks at, as, a, as almost like a neural network in humans. Um, so kind of 
dovetailing into that are, is soil development. Old growth forests build soils. Part of it has a lot to do with those mycorrhizal networks expanding the roots of trees. And, and um, it, it works in many different ways. One of the ways trees build soil is they, they keep things from sliding off slopes, sometimes on, on, on bare rock. And you can see how this, these birch roots are literally holding organic debris, which will end up becoming soil. In an older forest, you can start to see it's, it actually coats the rocks. There's been so much bryophytes are, are, are mosses in there and similar and, and club mosses and, and liverworts and similar low plants. And then herbs are generally, you know, plants that die back to the ground that don't grow above your waist. And these kind of small plant communities die and live and die and tree leaves fall and you get these soils that build. There, there are some that suppose that New England's landscape actually didn't appear very rocky when early settlers arrived, that there was so much leaf litter and duff and soil growth and soil accumulation that, that our, our landscape, even the rocky New England actually looked pretty smooth in the understory in terms of rockiness. Um, when this, when woody, all that woody debris in old forest hits the forest floor, a lot of that wood gets incorporated into the soil and trees are essentially 40% carbon. So that carbon, if, it, if it's kind of rot resistant older tree, it, chunks of wood will just be built into the soil without decomposing. More commonly, the wood is, is chewed up by microorganisms in the soil. And so essentially, the carbon from the atmosphere is brought into the tree and then from the tree into the deadwood, the deadwood into these tiny organisms. And those organisms only ever stay in the soil. So when they die, their bodies de deposit carbon into the soil. And over time, soils can absorb a lot of carbon. We actually don't know how much carbon, but it's a topic of intense study right now among researchers across the country. Um, on a more simple note, trees, uh, wet old trees can absorb a lot of moisture and in a dry sandy soil, that can be crucial for, for seedling sites for other trees. And you can see this, this forest is pretty, pretty dry and, and all the new trees are just growing on that old trunk in the ground. Another concept which we often overlook is that old growth forests are full of trees that have undergone the crucible of time. They have faced insect outbreaks, they have droughts, extreme cold, extreme heat, um, intense competition, strong winds. These trees that are living for 400 years really have great genetics. And over time, they reseed the forest and they become a self-sustaining forest of, of more, more and more proven um, individual trees. And so, when you compare that to a forest that's not an old growth forest, when, when, if the forest doesn't live very long, the trees don't have to endure that type of test. So we can have rather relatively non-resilient younger forests if they haven't, if they haven't developed this, this type of seed selection over time. Um, old growth forests buffer temperature and climate and moisture um, for, through a number of mechanisms, um, one of which is that they slow water. And they it, so water running off a hillside is caught by so much debris on the hillside that, it, that you, you generally in old growth forests don't get gullies or, or landslides or erosion. Um, and when that water hits the streams, those streams have, are shaded. So it's not warming up. And that because of all the, the logs and stuff that have collected in, in the streams, it slows. So it slows the overland travel of water, but it also slows the travel of water in waterways. And the effect this has is that groundwater actually intermingles with surface water in these streams. And it, groundwater is very cold because it's kept underground. And so that also is a kind of a, a reinforcing cold feature of these, of these streams. And like I said, the shade in these old growth forests can be extreme. And that really helps keep these, the, the ground cool, um, prevent evaporation, but also keep the, the waterways cold. Um, and, and as I mentioned with the soil, like these old forests, they store a lot of carbon. The, the, uh, these tree trunks here, um, I don't have a photo here, but some of the largest pines here at the game refuge easily store two to 3,000 board feet of timber. Um, and if you want to think of it a different way, if you were to put the, uh, an average house is two to 3,000 square feet around here, 
Well, one of these trees produces enough boards to put, to put new flooring across your entire livable living space in your house. Um, but also when these trees die, they don't have to be alive to store carbon. These trunks on the ground store carbon. And, um, and also, as I mentioned, there's carbon in the, in the soils. And there is a very heated debate right now about whether or not old growth forests store the most carbon. There's a lot of research out there to show that, um, that, that creative management in forests can store more carbon. Um, but I'm not going to get into that debate today because we can all agree that old growth st forests store a lot of carbon, regardless of who does it best. They're, they're really amazing. So let's take a quick review of that fire hose level flow of information I just gave you. Old growth forests provide habitat. They have an abundance of plants and fungi. They build soil. They serve as these amazing storehouses of different genetics that are, that are the most resilient. And they moderate temperature and climate and they buffer the landscape from climate change. And that should have been more clear. They store carbon in which is a great tool now to combat climate change. So should Connecticut's forests become old growth? Well, I think we can answer that with another resounding yes. But here comes the tricky part. Should all of it become old growth forest? And to understand this, I think what we really need to do is look back in time at our forests before European arrival on the landscape. What we find from, from, from uh, soil cores, um, from bogs that, that look at pollen for, for plant communities, but also looking at uh, reading old accounts from early arrivals into the area, and looking at a remnant old growth forest, we kind of put together, we kind of piece back the landscape somewhat. And what we find is that Native Americans really influence this landscape. And we've kind of erased their story from how we view landscape. Um, there was no such thing as wilderness or pristine forest. Native Americans, well, it depends on how you view, use the terms pristine and wilderness, but Native Americans worked throughout our forests. And one of the things they did mostly is they burned the upland areas. And I, I don't mean like California wildfire burns. What I mean is they would light fires on in the leaf litter and the pine duff at certain times throughout the year to burn off the shrubs and the small trees. And they would do this repeatedly oh, for centuries. And we think that they did it for a thousand years before Europeans arrived. And um, that burned across areas that would carry fire. And that allowed them to move through the landscape that allowed them to hunt more easily. It also promoted blueberries and raspberries and other, other plants that, they, that were great food for, for, for humans. Um, but ravines, mountaintops, bogs, wet areas, those weren't burned. And so old growth certainly lived just fine in those areas. So essentially our forests in pre-colonial times were a mix of human managed and nat natural disturbance managed. And I say natural disturbance a lot, but what I mean are wind, snow, flood, fire, things that, that are not human caused that affect the landscape. And this is maybe what Native American burning looked like. You have trees like, and here these are pines, but pines and oaks with thick bark generally are not affected by these small fires that kind of burn the understory. And um, they also, if they do die, they sprout aggressively from the roots. And so uh, pines don't sprout, but oaks do and hickories do and chestnuts do. And so, um, well, I'll explain in a second, but if you look at the landscape of, New of Connecticut, you can see anywhere it's light colored, that's kind of a highland or an upland. And anywhere where it's dark, you see a, a lowland. And you can see a lot of Connecticut is this constantly changing topography, which means that the forest, if the uplands received fire, well, the forest type is constantly changing as you go from ridge to valley, ridge to valley. And so old growth forests like this certainly existed across the, the pre-colonial landscape. But where there was fire, it really looked different. Um, oaks, hickories, and chestnut trees grew in, in many places like, like a park where, there was, where fire burned out a lot of the understory. And this, of course, is not a, an original forest of the Connecticut park-like forest. Um, this is at the Yale Myers Forest in a harvest that, that, that replicates that early, that early quality of, of forest. And in some areas, the fires were, were burned so regularly, or maybe it was dry and, and so fires, uh, so trees didn't come back quickly. You actually had savannas 
these oak savannas. This is actually a real oak savanna in Wisconsin that had similar ecology of frequent fire that burned the understory. Um, and then Europeans arrived and we pretty much scout the landscape clean. And uh, at one point, so we did it for agriculture. And then in the early 1800s, we did it for sheep. And we were actually the sheep capital of the world for a couple of decades in the early 1800s here in, in New England. And so really nothing was left. You, you can see, and this is a diorama from the, from the Harvard forest. If you're interested, you can go to, up, up into Petersham, Massachusetts. They have an amazing ver, display of, of these dioramas um, that are extremely lifelike. That, that, that show what the landscape looked like historically. And you can see there is a little forest here for a wood lot, maybe to cut, cut trees for, for repairs on the farm, but most trees were gone. But then the Industrial Revolution came and the railroad moved people west. The Erie Canal brought people west and the Australia and New Zealand were colonized. And all of a sudden sheep did a lot better in these other places than in New England. And well, people decided to move down into the valleys where they could work in, 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 the, in mills for the Industrial Revolution and farms were just abandoned. And so the forests rebounded. But then in the early 1900s, chestnut blight wiped out essentially all of our chestnut trees. And so that kind of leaves us with our forests today, which are 60 to 80 years, mostly dominated by oak. And in some places, they are they're going through later stages of succession. And so there's no fire and, and on our landscape anymore. And many, a whole lot of Connecticut isn't experiencing any type of, of logging or, or firewood cutting. It, it, it did in the past, but it's not anymore. And so a lot of our forest is becoming old growth, just like this, this image I showed you earlier, this large tulip tree and this large oak are in the canopy, but these large trees are falling out over time and you have these shady, hemlocks and birches coming up. And eventually, essentially we're losing our oak forests. Why? Because oak seedlings cannot grow in shade. Hickories are a little bit more tolerant of shade, but essentially oak, tree, oak seedlings need full sunlight to grow into a tree. Otherwise they, they linger on the forest floor like this and, and they'll die. It might take 40 years, but they'll die. Um, and so why does that matter? that our oak forests are declining. Maybe not immediately, but over the next decades, we'll see a lot of this. Well, oak forests, they feed the whole complement of animals in the game refuge directly and indirectly. Bears can eat so many pounds of, of acorns and hickory nuts, it's scary. Uh, but birds certainly eat them, not hatches and, and, and blue jays will. But also the oak leaves especially, but hickories as well, support an enormous number of moths and butterfly caterpillars. They feed on the leaves. And um, uh, you can see a bluebird here is eating a caterpillar. Um, to put a number to it, uh, Doug Ptolemy is a, a well-known uh, biologist and he documented over 550 species of moth and butterfly caterpillars on white oak trees, which are an important tree here in Connecticut. And just barely over half that number on a sugar maple, which is a, one of the most common trees in an old growth forest. So we, we, so we lose an important food for mammals and birds as our forests decline in oak. The other thing is oak trees are really resilient to, to drought um, and, and heat, extreme weather. Their strong limbs can handle wind quite well. And so they're very, they're, they're among our most resistant forest types to climate change. And so having them helps our forest, helps our landscape become more resilient in the long term. They also have their own unique complement of plant, insect, and fungal communities. And this is a, an Eastern black trumpet fungus, which is a really neat one to find. And this is in one of our more developed old oak forests. But this, this, this can be replicated for different um, species. There's a blueberries and and uh, mountain laurel are, are what we call ericaceous plants, which, which are most abundant in oak forests. And something that gets overlooked a lot is how important oak, oaks are in terms of providing for humans. Uh, all of our different trees can be used for something, but oak trees, especially right now, are our number one flooring material for, for wooden floors across 
across the US. And a lot of it is grown here in the East. And, um, you know, if we didn't buy and use wood products grown here, they'd have to come from somewhere else. And again, that's this is another topic for another day, but, but when in New England, our wood harvesting is done quite well for the most part. Even a sloppy job in New England, we, you know, with, uh, we can just, and we can discuss what that means, but generally there's rutting, there's tree damage, et cetera. We still generally go, are, are, are easy on the environment. But when we don't buy, when we buy products that are made of rubber wood or, or eucalyptus, those are grown on plantations um, in Brazil, in India, in Indonesia, where rainforest was cleared to make that. And then that wood was shipped across the world to come to us. So, and we're talking about, if we're concerned about carbon and atmospheric carbon, harvest or using local wood products is really important in decreasing the carbon impact. So let's, let's just take a quick review here. Why do oak forests matter? Well, they have been on our landscape for a thousand years, thousands probably. We know that our current landscape settled in its forest composition only about 2000 years ago. Um, that's, I believe that's when chestnuts arrived. They're more of a Southern tree. But and Native Americans have been here as long as our forests have been here. Because before that, it was just ice. And, and so our oaks, oaks have every right to be on our landscape in abundance. Um, and they also provide important ecological roles that either are unique to them or are hard to replicate in old growth forests and that they provide nut nuts. Old growth forests are, don't have a lot of nut producing trees. Um, they, they also support the greatest uh, variety and abundance of, of moth and butterfly caterpillars, Lepidoptera. They're well adapted to heat and, and climate change. They have unique plant and insect and animal associations and they're, they really support our local economies. So, should all of this maturing forest in Connecticut become old growth? And I, I say no, I say an overwhelming no. And, but, so that kind of leaves us in the lurch. So how do, what do we do with this kind of split in forests? One of them, one is do nothing and let nature take its course. And one is become involved, which may sound really counterintuitive. And so to help us out, the, the researchers from High, the Highstead Foundation here in Connecticut and the, the Harvard Forest up in Massachusetts and a variety of other researchers across the, the Northeast, we're all working together to create a framework called Woodlands and Wildlands to help us land managers make decisions about how much land should go to what use. And what they've decided, and here you can say, they, they, start, they started this in 2010 and I, I've been involved for the past couple of years um, through the Game Refuge. And they, what they've decided is, they want to, they, they've got a trajectory for 2060 on these targets of percentages of different use. And, and this is the summary. They want to conserve 70% of New England's forests. 90% of the forests are woodlands. And woodlands um, are forests that are managed by people for a whole variety of reason, reasons in different ways. Um, that might be cutting timber for, in a, for to, to sell to mills, you know, economically feasible wood operations. They could also be, a, you know, a, a landowner in Granby who cuts down trees occasionally for firewood. Or they can be people who, who clear the understory of forests and inoculate logs for shiitake mushrooms, or people who grow ginseng or blue cohosh, and they do, they manipulate the land in some way. So it's, so 90% of the forest has some type of human use. And then 10% as just protected for nothing to happen there. And right now, we're trying to figure out what is actually happening across the state. Um, the Woodlands and Wildlands Project right now is actually pretty close on getting all of the area of cataloging all the areas that have um, strict wildland protocols. And the game refuge is in there in their list. And we've over 4,000 of the acres of the game refuge falls into that category where we, we really don't want to do anything. And um, but a lot of Connecticut, nothing is happening. A lot of private landowners don't do anything. And so for 10% of our forests um, to be, be unmanaged, we may be there already. We, a lot of, a lot of uh, forest land managers in the, in, the, in the state expect it's a lot higher than 10% of lands that just where nothing is happening. It's just growing old. And um, the, the researchers over at the Yale uh, 
Forest, E.L. Myers Forest in East Road and Ashford, Connecticut, are trying to take steps to, 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 to maintain the oak forests. And there, this is a, a, two years ago, the students were lighting fires in the understory, prescribed fires to burn off the undergrowth and start to recreate in some areas, some of this oak open forest, which is really the most natural oak forest that, that, that has been in, in, in Connecticut. But unfortunately, fire is just not feasible for so many reasons. One, you can't control it all the time. Most of the people around here that work on fires are quite, quite talented. But you can't control it all the time. And frankly, New England is awfully so wet, it's really hard to even get a fire to light. Um, so the best option is often timber operations, which, are, which, believe it or not, are often lighter on the landscape. They, they, uh, if you cut down certain trees like maples, they'll sprout back up. If you burn the maples, it, it can kill their roots. So, so it's not, so timber operations are not as good as fire at maintaining these oak woodlands, but it's, it's a good start. And um, so that can, and that, that can have different effects. This is, this is an area that's been thinned out to promote oak trees and hickory trees to, um, you can see here on the left, this is, this is hickory and these are oak trees here. And um, you can see on the understory, it's pretty, pretty sparse, but all the old oak stumps will sprout and hopefully the acorns and, and hickory nuts will, will return. And this will be a forest that can self-sustain as oak over time because there's enough light for them. Um, and in areas that receive a, a stronger treatment, this is what we call a shelter wood um, timber management, is where you take the, the kind of the biggest and most amazing trees in the forest and you, you, you sequentially remove the other trees and create this, this growing environment that's almost all light, but with some, some moderation um, created by these, these older canopy trees. And they are the best trees that have lived the longest. And so their seed source is reseeding the whole understory. And so this is another way to, to, to keep oak forests in the landscape. And so I'm sure there, I'm hoping that there was something in, in this presentation that, that piqued your interest. But if, if, if I could get you to, to, to focus on a few takeaways from it, I just want you to be aware that, that our forests are aging. And I know that we see forests in a snapshot of time and we think that they will always stay the same, but forests are always changing and they can change dramatically in, in, in just one person's lifetime. And they're going to be old growth if nothing is done. Um, and that's, like I said, and that is a great thing. It's, it's a really important and wonderful thing that our forests are becoming old growth. But we, but, but both old growth and oak hickory forests that are, you know, oak hickory forests that are, that are dependent on some type of disturbance they're both ecologically really important for Connecticut. And they're both historically significant. So, you, you know, our forests in the future don't have to look the way they did in the past. But if we want to support all the plants and animals that are here, that are native, we really should, as land managers, be looking at both old growth forests and oak hickory forests as tools to, to, to support the landscape. So, um, uh, if you have questions, which I hope you do, please reach out to me. This is my email address here. This is the best way to get in touch with me. I I'm happy to connect you with other professionals that work in the field as well. Um, but um, I'm, I'm generally available and I would happy to be happy to talk to all of you about all these things. And so without further ado, I'm going to close down my screen and let Holly take over. And I'd love to sit and answer any questions you have now. Well, Connor, thank you so much for that really thorough presentation. And yes, we have lots of questions in the chat for you. So I thank you. Um, 